but we all do it. You do it too? I do it all the time. Yes. Oh. I make. Mean- Welcome back. I am here today with Susan Crawford, the Susan Crawford. I just want to say that recently I interviewed Sydney Craybaugh and she referred to you, Susan, as the patron saint of vintage knitting. So (laughs) I think that combined with the fact that you're the author of a number of books, Stitch in Time, volumes one, two, three. Is there a volume four now? Not yet, but I'll never say never. <laughs> okay, so volumes one, two, and three, and then Vintage Shetland Project. And there might be other books, I, I don't know. But I think that's a good enough introduction. I'm pretty sure that everyone watching this channel knows who Susan Crawford is. And we're going to have a conversation as soon as she tells us where she is currently situated. Then we're going to start to talk about sweaters that she's knit and her backstory. So Susan, where are you? Well, right at this very moment, I am in my uh, studio space, which is in a Victorian mill on the banks of a canal in uh, the city of Lancaster, which is in, that's in the UK, not Lancaster, US. Um, and that is um, in the northwest of England, uh, on the basically on the Irish Sea, which is so that sort of we are quite close to the US in terms of UK. So we're on the far west side. So we're as near to the US as you can get really on the west side. Um, so this is where I come to work each day. Um, but then I also um, I live not far from here, but a little bit further north in what is called the Lake District, which is sort of the um, exactly what it says, really. It's a it's a place full of different, full of lakes, full of trees, uh, full of water, uh, lots of rain to feed those lakes. Um, and it's very much it's classed as a national park. So it's a. It's a protected environment, and that's where basically we do a lot of our photography, where I spend a lot of my time on my days when I'm not in the studio. Um, It has beautiful landscapes. It's where William Wordsworth and Dorothy Wordsworth lived. It's where Beatrix Potter wrote most, if not all, of her books. Um, It's where Ruskin and Turner both painted some of their famous paintings. So it's a it's a it's a quite spectacular part of the world, to be honest with you. Um, it's it's quite it's quite wild, but at the same time, it's it's also warm and welcoming. So it's sort of that combination of sort of the best of everything, really. So beautiful, yeah. Beautiful. So Thank that you. is where I am. <laughs> so one quick question related to that: If somebody were to fly into Heathrow, how long a journey is it to get to your part of the UK? Well, actually, it's not too bad. Um, it's about three hours on, on a train from London. Um, you can actually fly into either Manchester or Glasgow as well, which are both about, uh, well, actually, Glasgow is less than two hours away. Manchester's about an hour and a half away. Um, so we're, we're we're in a really good spot, really. There's a, we, we sort of link to to both those airports on on a national railway line so it's really easy to to get to us great I, I missed it I was in Shetland and Edinburgh and Glasgow just about a year and a half ago when I went to Shetland oh yes I had to go see the original we should of course start by talking about Jeannie since I'm wearing mine which by the way took me about four and a half months to knit it does take a while. Size one needles. Thank you very much, Susan. This is one of the patterns in Susan's Vintage Shetland Project book that is sold separately. A lot of the a lot of the patterns you must buy the book, but this one she's put up for sale individually. So I jumped on that with a group of people who are followers of mine, and we all knitted together, which was really fun. 
And Susan sells kits for this. So one of the people, Nancy, I think she purchased two of these kits. She loved the yarn so much. So here's mine, just for your edification. I did not use the original colors, but please show us yours and tell us about how you came, really how you came up with this idea to take vintage patterns and bring them into the 21st century. Okay. So yeah, so this is this is my original still recreation of a vintage original, but my my version of it, which is as close to the original as it could possibly be within the limits of what yarns and colours and things I had available to me. So you can just see the the detail there. Um, and this is this is a garment that you, as you say, you can see on display in the in the Shetland Museum. It's mounted on a on a board and is quite I feel it's quite stiffly presented in a way. So you can see the beauty of it, but you can't actually you can't get the the sense of the drape and the softness because it's sort of on a board to sort of really show it off. Um, but it was, I think it's probably one of the first garments I ever saw when I went to the vintage, Shet went to the Shetland Museum. I think I, I spotted it almost right away. I think that the little cupboard that it's housed in was pulled out. Um, so it was, it was noticeable instantly. And I think it's one of those garments that once you see it, you can't possibly just walk past it. You have to stop and look at it and ad admire it. Um, but what happened is I, I think I had been, I think I'd been up to Shetland once or twice, I think twice. And then, um, the curator of the museum, um, contacted me and asked me if next time I was visiting, I would like to go to the museum and meet her. And, um, if I would, if I would be interested, she could show me some of the pieces that were in the archive. So basically the museum only has on display the smallest number of garments that they actually have in their possession and away from the museum up a hill and in a in a very unassuming sort of metal uh, industrial unit is housed the rest of the archive and in there sort of all um climately controlled and so on and all packed up so that the light can't get to them and things are just hundreds and hundreds mm. of knitted pieces there's also all sorts of other things there obviously there's you know ancient things going back to the bronze age and things but of course from my point of view it's the knitwear that I, I'm interested in um and so we we talked and I said I'd be really interested in seeing more so um, Carol se selected a number of pieces that she thought I would be interested in seeing. And she also enabled me to say if there were any on display that I would like taking off display so, so I could get a better look at them. Yeah. So they very kindly got the original uh, genie out amongst others. Um, and yes, yeah, so then one day I went off to this archive and um, just laid out in front of me were all these beautiful sort of parcels of white tissue and on top of them were many many beautiful pieces of of Shetland knitwear um, and that's where it all started at, at first it was just going to look at them and then it was it was sort of it was basically left to me to say what I would like to do in relation to these pieces what sort of research work or whatever I would I would be interested in um, and that was when I started to think well none of them have patterns so what do I know how to do and one of the things that you know I've done for a long time is is take vintage knitting patterns and convert them and make them easier for people to to knit from but I've never done or I've not done it on a large scale, actually taking knitted pieces and actually re reading the patterns from those. So that's 
that was the first step. I thought, right, well, what I can do, I can, I can basically read the pattern in front of me and turn it into a pattern that people can can utilize and knit from. And then I can multi-size them, which is obviously the thing that I like doing the most. But then as I was doing that, I also began to realize that there was so much more to these pieces. Um, and talking to the curator, there were little snippets of information. Some of them had more information than others that made me realize that there were stories inside the garments. Mm -hmm. There were things that I could find out. Um, and Jeannie is one of those perfect um, examples, really. There is so, so much in, um, in the archive material about Jeannie and her life. Um, she's even done recordings, I think it was in the late 1980s, early 1990s with the local radio station that are recorded. Really? Yeah. I did, yes. Yeah, I went to the archive and listened to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, she doesn't talk much about knitting, really. Most of what she was, she was considered really sort of a, um, almost a local historian because she'd been around in Lerwick in Shetland for so, so long that she could tell them all about the shops that had been there, the different businesses that had been there. And it was a lot of the a lot of the the conversation is about the changing face of Shetland rather than her personal life. But the hair on the back of my neck is standing <laughs> up. It's literally giving me the chills because I love this. I just I love this so much. When I was there, there was one shop window that was filled with vintage sweaters. You probably know the woman, I forget her name now, but her mother and her aunt were knitting in competitions and she has all of their sweaters. They're not in the museum. There might be no. others knit by these women. But um, I that reminded me that I wanted to ask you about the yarn that Jeannie used because I, I must say when I was there, I knew I was going to see this sweater. Yeah. And I know the gauge is the finest gauge that I've ever knit at. And I will never knit this gauge again, <laughs> 46 stitches to four inches or 10 centimeters. But I suspected that the original might be at a different gauge. So I brought with me a tape measure and I stood in front of that case with my tape measure, took a photograph so that I could go home and really like parse out and count. And I think I counted, well, do you know exactly her gauge? I would do if I knew where my notes were, because okay, obviously so, that's one of the things I did. But yeah, I think it's even finer, isn't it? It is, is it? finer. I yeah. think that I counted about a hundred stitches in four inches. Yeah, it's absolutely minute. And there is some, she, she actually knit, to be honest with you, there's a book in Jeannie. Jeannie's life was incredible. She was, there's, there's a film to be made about Jeannie. She had such a colourful life, really colourful. But she, um, her parents had a, a general store that included selling, we think, some yarns. But certainly, um, we believe that they sold uh, clothes dye. And we think one of the things that she did when she was making this was actually dyed the yarns herself. And it was made of 100% rayon, the original garment, which obviously was in the 1930s when Jeannie was making this. It was um, it was known as artificial silk. And that was how it was marketed to people was that, you know, yes, you can't afford silk so you can have. The next best thing which is which is rayon but rayon is very stiff compared to silk whereas silk is so soft rayon is quite a, a hard material to use and Jeannie does actually uh, comment uh, that she she had cuts in her fingers from the from handling the the yarn that it was so so harsh on on her fingers oh. um 
But yeah, we think basically we think that she hand dyed all the colours, which is why so many of them are quite so similar to each other. She probably did multiple baths of the same of the same dye to get the, the graduated shades of, of gold that she used. Um, and there is, we will never ever know, but there is some thoughts that it possibly came out smaller than maybe she had expected it to because she was using the rayon and it was so fine and, and, and such a such a tight gauge, which is also probably why it was hurting her fingers because she was knitting it on almost tighter than she, probably tighter than she needed to be doing. But there's a picture um, of her wearing it. That's not Jeannie. It's not her. That's not Jeannie, oh. no. That's somebody who modeled it for her. Oh. Um, Okay, well, thanks for um, the, setting that record straight. I always yeah, it it's one of those things. It's on the postcard that you can buy, but it's not. It's not Jeannie. <laughs> this is uh, this is Jeannie herself. Um, <laughs> Quite a different look. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but she's a, yeah, she's a she's a. It's a completely different. I did I did find out more about that, but right at this moment, I couldn't I couldn't tell you who it was. But yeah, it's it was somebody who modelled it on her behalf because it was such a small, fit her. Such a small garment. Okay, okay. Yeah, and wow. she she entered it into um, a children's wear competition in a in a newspaper. So we think she probably didn't intend for it to be children's wear, but then when she saw the competition, she probably thought it was small enough to to put into so it had to have taken her many months also just oh yes the sheer number of stitches i mean i don't i didn't calculate how many stitches it would have been if it was 100 stitches to four a lot <laughs> over a hundred thousand perhaps i i don't know I, I haven't done the math but it's a lot of knitting and it's very, very yeah. dainty. Maybe they were always knitting at that gauge. I don't know. Did you see other things knit at that gauge? There are some things. There aren't an awful lot, but there are some. Um, I would say the finest knitting is normally the lace because because that's more open, you don't have that same hardware on your on your fingers. So this is quite quite an unusual piece. The um I haven't got it here in the room but um highland was also done on a very uh tight gauge which is also in the book i'll just show you that was this one mm. that was not quite as tight but still a very fine gauge and um, also in rayon but, no that one was in wool but i have i did find other rayon garments for a for a period of a few years it became very popular um, it was a it was a trend basically it was a fashion so yeah for, for a short period of time there are quite a lot of rayon garments dotted about um, in different museums and things that you can see um, and some of them are mixed with wool you know so normally when you're in an archive I believe you're required to wear those little white cotton gloves yeah Did they allow you to take the gloves off and touch any of these garments yeah, they did actually. Yeah, most of the time, nearly all the time I had the gloves on, but occasionally they did let me take them off and actually, so I could feel the fibre and understand how what how it felt and how it was spun and things like that. Yeah, I'm yeah. so envious. And how did it <laughs> feel? It's, it's quite, yeah, it's quite overwhelming, to be honest with you, that... The, the the most extreme circumstance was um actually when we were trying to transcribe um the Ralph sweater. Which again, I'll just have to show you a picture out of the book. Um but uh this one. This one here. My my father's name oh, is it? Ralph. Oh. Well, it's actually named after the man who wore it, who was who was a Ralph as well. Mm. But it was he he ended up being taken a prisoner of war um, 
in um, Hong Kong um, by um, during the, the the Second World War, um, and he had his Ralph sweater with him, and it had been knitted by his. At the, she was his fiance at the time that she knitted it. They were married when um, when he was taken prisoner of war. But she was she was not in Hong Kong at, the, at that time. So fortunate. Well, unfortunately, they were separated. But fortunately, only one of them had to go through um, being a prisoner of war. But this sweater was with him the whole time he was captive. Um, when you look at it, there are many, many darns all over it where he's tried to keep it together. Some of it on looking at it, I think, is taken from um, feed sacks and things of that nature, um, where because it's not wool, it's a much coarser fibre that is used to just sort of do a little darn here or at the, at the cuff or whatever, just to stop it from all disintegrating. Um, and so, yes, we, we were in this, we were in the archive one day and I had the sweater out in front of me. Um, and I was beginning to feel a bit uncomfortable. I was getting a bit of a scratchy throat and even my face was feeling a bit sore and a bit itchy. And I was thinking, oh, this is a bit strange. I wonder if I'm coming down with something and oh, I do hope not, you know, in the way you do. And then the blinds were closed because obviously you do, you, you're trying to keep the natural sunlight and the UV off the off the fabric because that can damage them. But at one moment, the sun must have got directly behind the blinds. And so it still illuminated the room. And as I looked down, all I could see was tiny, tiny fibres sort of floating up out of the jumper and they were landing on me. And I'd obviously breathed them in. And that was just the, I, I burst into tears, to be honest with you, because I couldn't quite handle or cope with the thought that this jumper had sort of become part of me in a way, literally, you know, that it, uh, it fragments of it had sort of been, had entered into my body, which was just, yeah, it was, it was quite a moment. Really. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. <laughs> And of course, the more that I read about his life and the more you realised what he'd been through and what, what this sweater had been through, it really felt quite, yeah, I don't know if special is the right word, but it felt really quite, I really don't know what the word is. Oh, yeah, overwhelming is the only way I can describe it, really. Just the thought that, you know, I was that close to it that it sort of became part of me as well, so. What an amazing story. Oh, my. And you probably have thousands of others of similar ilk. And they're all in the book, these stories? A, a lot of them are, yes. Yeah. G again, just because of space, things like Ralph's story and Jeannie's story are very compressed and sort of limited to where it relates to the knit, the knitwear or specifically but each of the many of them I could have I could have written you know small books about each of them really because the, there was so much to talk about I mean Ralph was awarded um medals for bravery many years later and he he never even mentioned it he was very very circumspect about his time in captivity and what he did to to help other people and things and he just lived a very very quiet life and and didn't want I suppose didn't want to be reminded of it maybe even but it, he and his family kept his sweater for you know until he passed away and then they they, they bequeathed it to the the museum was he originally from Shetland yeah he was a Shetlander yeah I wonder how he ended up in Hong Kong he was an engineer he was a civil engineer. So he started off uh, building many of the roads that you'd have been driving around on in Shetland. Um, he was, when they first started getting good roads in the 1920s, he was he was involved with that, with the Shet with Shetland Council. And then um, when, when war broke out and he, he joined the military, 
his experience and knowledge. Um, oh no, actually no, I think he went to Hong Kong first. He, yeah, he did. He um, he start, He was working in Hong Kong as an engineer um, prior to war breaking out, and then he just got caught up at yeah. the wrong time. Mm -hmm. I had people in my family in Asia who were also taken as prisoners of war, sent to Tomas in the Philippines and also mm. in the time. Yeah. Anyway, let's talk about yeah. some others. <laughs> so yes, yeah. we'll dwell on that part. I mean, that's the thing you got. This is the thing about, I think about the stories in knitwear. Sometimes they don't necessarily tell you something you you want to hear they might even tell you something that's quite uncomfortable even about the person who you're you're looking into you know but it's the fact that textiles can tell us so much that is so incredible about them you know that's why it's so important to make and to make things that you treasure and keep because they just they just say so much about the about the person about the wearer that you know that they can be passed on and they you know your story can be told 100 years later just through a through a piece of knitwear i hope i hope my grandchildren great grandchildren if there ever are any will remember <laughs> grandma billy the knitter I think I'm sure they'll value it. I'm sure. I mean, one of the, the, the next piece I've brought is also from the Vintage Shetland. And this one really shows how family have valued what um have valued the knitwear. And this one, um, you might have seen this one because it's quite it's been knitted a lot on them um, and shown a lot on on Instagram and things. But this is this is Yule. I think you probably knew I was gonna show Yule then, didn't you? Um, but this, this is the very original, this is the same size as the original, which as you can see, it's really quite, quite a small, a small piece. Um, but this one is not on display in the museum. This is one of the ones that you, is only viewable if you get to go into the, the archive, which is a, which is a shame because it is a beautiful, beautiful sweater. And it's really quite unique. These double lines of theory motifs that change um, is quite unusual. You often you don't often see um, two lines of theories like that. Um, it's normally only one, and it's really nice the way they've been reversed on the two. On the two, so you've got dark on light, then light on dark, and so on. So it's it's really quite a special and beautiful design. Again. It's quite fine, as you can tell by the number of motifs had, uh, across it. Um, but it enabled them to do far more detailed motifs by keeping the, the gauge small. Um, but this one, I wanted to recreate it just because it was it was beautiful. It was mm -hmm. it was absolutely mm -hmm. stunning. But I had no story to tell. There was literally next to nothing known about it at all, other than it had belonged to a serviceman from Shetland who had been in the RAF in the Second World War, and his name was Bob Ewell. And pretty much the new, we didn't really know anything else. Oh, the, the one other fact we knew was that he had become a doctor, but we didn't really know how that fact had sort of come to be known so I'd recreated the sweater I had photographed the sweater I had multi-sized the sweater we were all ready to go but it was not going to be able to go in the book because I didn't have anything to say about it which was oh, just God. breaking my heart I just did not know what I was going to do I then became ill as you, you probably know about my cancer, which we won't dwell on today, but basically that caused a delay in the in the completion of the book. And when I went back to working on the book, I just thought, you know, I'm just going to give this one last shot. I'm just going to try again and see if I can find anything out. And I just randomly, and I don't know why, I just randomly in Google just put in um, Dr. Yule and I missed the Bob out. And 
Bob didn't come up, but there was this one sort of little piece on about the, I don't know, the 20th page of Google as I was going through all the all the results. And it showed a black and white newspaper clipping photograph of a um, string quartet, um, just a small local quartet who were who'd been playing in some village hall or something the night before. Um, and one of the four was called Dr. Martin Ewell. And I thought, oh, that's strange because it's such a Shetland name. And then I looked and Dr. Martin Newell lived or was in my local newspaper. So the the newspaper here is called the Lancaster Guardian, and it was a picture of Dr. Martin Newell in the Lancaster Guardian. And I thought, this this is odd. This is really, really odd. So um I thought, well, how I can't ring up the doctor's surgery because with uh, privacy and all of those things nobody's going to let me just ring up and speak to to somebody because I want to know about maybe he's the son of somebody um so I thought how else am I going to go about this and I happened to net be again purely because of having been ill I had been visiting a scar tissue uh, therapist who had been helping me with the 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 results of of my mastectomy um, and I happened to know that she played in a quintet and I thought and she knew him <laughs> well I went to see her that night I happened to have an appointment went to see her walked through the door and said do you know doc do you know Martin Ewell and she went oh yes Martin I know him really well why do you want to know she said you've got to be kidding so I I I I said yeah I I've got this hunch that he's the person I need to speak to. Do you think there's any way you could put me in touch? And she said, yep, I will ring him and give him your number. That same night I got a phone call and there was this, this beautiful soft Shetland accent at the other end of the phone. And I can't do it, so I'm not going to try. But he said, this is, this is, uh, this is Martin Yule. I believe you want to talk to me about my, my father. And Bob was his dad. And it was Martin who had held on to the sweater after his father had passed away. And it was Martin who had donated it to the, the museum. Oh, wow. And that was so, recorded at the museum who donated it? It was. It, um, it, well, it been. It, when it was done, there was a period when the records were really quite poor and there weren't proper, there wasn't proper records at, at that mm -hmm. point. They're very, very good now. But they weren't. It was different people who were in charge of it back then. Um, it's possible he might have donated. I can't remember now. He might have donated it to the smaller museum that didn't have quite the same sort of um, professional practices. Not that they're not professional, but they weren't taught to do it in a specific way, I suppose. So, yeah, so it just got it just got missed. Um, so. Martin came what to see me. It? it was amazing. I know. And he had it's again, Bob's story could I, I could have filled a book. I've got all Bob's diaries. I've got um the well, I haven't got them. I've I've had access to Bob's diaries, I've had access to um flight records, I've had access to family photographs, uh, everything I needed to know and more. And it basically transpired that Bob just this jumper was everything to Bob um, and his his auntie, his auntie Katie had knitted it for him and um, he had taken it to war with him and he had worn it on every flight he had made. He was a, a radio operator in in um, one of the bombers. Can't remember which one, but Hal Halifax, I think. Um, and I think the life expectancy was 40 days and he survived the entire war um, and he's absolutely convinced that it was because he wore his jumper every single time the only time he didn't wear it he was in a crash so that he was just convinced he did his medical exams while wearing it and he became a doctor it was just can it I, meant can I borrow it? <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, actually, we've just um, 
Martin has just had one knitted for him and I've got I've got I'll send you it I've got a photo of me and Martin um from a few weeks ago with Martin in his oh I would love to see that in his sweater that he's had so he now has his own and his son has got one as well so because I've multi-sized the pattern it's meant that they've been able to to have them knitted for themselves as well because obviously they're much bigger than Bob was Bob was a very um small and petite uh chap so uh yeah so it was it, it that one was probably I think because of now the personal connection it's it's meant so much that one and it's given Martin such um joy to have his father's story told um you know so it it felt like I did something really special with that I'm just sitting here thinking every cloud has a silver lining exactly the cloud of your illness took you to this specific doctor who unlocked Pandora's box yeah yeah if I hadn't have been ill the book would have gone to press without Bob's and story, the story and would it, not be told probably no no and it's so amazing it's it's like I just can't believe how amazing that is yeah when, there was the, it, it it was one of those it was a really I think there was yeah there was forces at play I think to make sure that it, if you're it, gonna be sick have something really like luxurious and mystical and magical happen that's kind of like life altering <laughs> yeah yeah and say that he's now you know martin is now a friend we, he pops in oh. and sees us and you know his sister is also coming to see us at some point she's got more things of bobs that she wants to show me and oh, you know so it's, it's just lovely yeah lovely oh, wow susan yeah. <laughs> it's like wow 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 how, <laughs> like how can you top that we should just end right here that's like you can't get better than that or maybe you can i don't know keep going i don't think i can get better i think i've peaked but i can i will certainly try and carry on at least but <laughs> and yes yeah, so i thought i'd bring things forward a little bit and also show you um this is this has fast become a favourite. This one technically was uh, an incredible challenge. This one is Jojo, which is the sweater um, from the latest Stitch in Time that a lot of people have been desperate to uh, be able to, to knit. Um, but again, it's a one size vintage pattern. Um, and this, this particular version that I've done. Um, I don't know whether you've seen Jojo Rabbit, the, yes. the film. Well, this is the she exactly same yeah. colorway as Scarlett Johansson wears in the film. And this is what I wanted to uh, attempt to recreate. Um, but of course, because this was the, the version of this that I was wanting to duplicate was knitted for um, by a costume department for a film. They didn't conscientiously follow the pattern in terms of the the color layout, so it was it was really complicated to actually get this recreated in a way that could then be converted into a usable pattern. So this is a an a, it it actually worked as a slip stitch, so it's actually a really really easy. If you have a, if if something like Genie is a bit scary, and um, this is a great pattern to. Uh, do what looks like a colour work pattern, but without actually having to carry two yarns at any one time. This one, you can just see the slip stitches here. So you only use one colour at any one time and you just carry the, the, the slip stitch up every over two rows and you get what basically look like little bunny ears, which I think is why they used it for Jojo Rabbit because it uh, looks like it looks like a bunny rabbit. That's clever. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, so this, so the original pattern, I think, uses the black and white vintage pattern uses four colours. 
can't even put four fingers up, four colours. Um, it also says that you can use five. This one is based on an eight colour repeat, but I don't know whether you can quite see it on here, but it actually doesn't repeat in, it actually changes halfway up. So it's it's an eight colour pattern repeat, but it uses uh, two different colours on the repeat. So it ends up, it's a 56 row repeat, which is a very long repeat when you're trying to grade something because 56 rows is halfway up a garment and you've already done it all once. So it was really, really complicated to do the maths. But I also didn't want people to be sort of forced to have to do this version because I know lots of people have, have been have seen it in many different incarnations and in different uh, period dramas and things. And, it, you know, have wanted to do a lot of the different colorways. So in the end, I've sort of put in I've put in charts that you can color in yourself to do both um four colour, five colour, six colour, seven colour and eight colours. So you can decide what your colour palette is going to be and then you can Brilliant. colour it in to decide what you want. So it's it was a it was a real challenge. I've got to say it was a real challenge to do it, but I think it's such a great sweater. And if you do do a lot of colour work and you have lots of bits left over, it's also a great, great sweater for using odds and ends up with mm. which is what it was really all about again it's sort of that sort of you know wartime sort of mentality of make do and mend and use just use oddments so I mean you could actually do it with however many rows there are there you could do it with that many colors if you wanted to right, you could right, use right. Every, every oddment that you've got so this has a set in sleeve yeah do you have a background in pattern making or something, I mean, to be able to do a set and sleep for all the different sizes. I struggle with just my size if I'm using a vintage pattern and I have to make it fit me. I'm oh. always redoing the arm side. You must be masterful at that. Well, I, I did. Um, I've done dressmaking since a child. Um, and I think dressmaking is hugely helpful with vintage patterns because they were written primarily as though they were recreating flat pieces of of patterns mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. if you think about when you cut out a dressmaking pattern that's that's really how vintage vintage garments of this period were really put put together um so yes yeah, so ha so having a dressmaking background did re has really really helped my my maternal grandmother was a was a dressmaker and she used to have me making clothes for my toys and things from a, a very early age. And although I didn't understand what I was doing, I think a, you, you you absorb a basic understanding at an early age that never never leaves you really. You've then just got a bit more of an instinctive grasp of what you, you're doing. But then I did also do, um, I did fashion and textiles at college um, and I did um, pattern cutting, although not to a very high standard. But I did I did a year of pattern cutting and but um, it's enough a year of tailoring. Yeah, it's enough for knitwear because knitwear is so forgiving. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I would say at school my worst subject was maths. I would say, to be honest with you, and yet it, this is all maths now. And I think if if they'd have ever thought to just give me some sort of practical application as to why maths would have been useful, I don't think it would have been my worst subject at all, because I think pattern and uh, certainly pattern repeat absolutely fascinates me. The number of, you know, stitches and blocks and the building blocks of a of a knitting pattern absolutely fascinate me. And then the three dimensional uh, construction of of clothing is just I mean it's so complex it's amazing really when you think you know how 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 clever it is to to you know be able to clothe the body really it's a it's it's a fascinating subject are you and familiar, constantly learning 
Are you familiar with a designer, fashion designer named Charles James? Have you ever heard of him? Oh, no, I haven't. No. no. American, popular in the 50s, I think. But his clothing was very structural. It, the pattern makers had a really hard time because it wasn't just a flat, two-dimensional piece of fabric. It became like, not origami, but there were lots of structural things that he would have mm. to actually pin on the model I'll try and put a picture in here of something yeah. to see what I'm talking I'm gonna about I'm going to write that down so I Charles can Charles James American very very interesting type of pattern mm. design fabulous the metropolitan museum did a retrospective on him a number of years ago and all right piece was more fabulous than the next because they're three-dimensional sculptures and really wow. fascinating you're um inspiring me to maybe like go take a course at fit the fashion institute of technology you should trust just in pattern making because i struggle so much with sleeves I mean, they are, they're incredibly complicated. I mean, that's what, I mean, to be honest with you, yokes, you know, I can understand, I'm wearing one myself today, and I can understand why they are popular, because they, they avoid that problem, basically, of, of the setting sleeve. They do, they, you but know. you don't get a fit, necessarily. No. I mean, maybe your yokes have a very good fit, because you might be expert at yoke design. But often I see there's like too much fabric in here. So, yeah. well, it, it's a hard, it is a hard one to get. It is a hard one to get right. Um, I found as well. Um, I'm yeah, because I no longer really have much of a chest because, well, I've only got, I've got one and, and none at the moment still. I don't have any, any, any filler here for want of a better, better way of describing it. So yokes struggle a little bit to fit me properly because I don't, I don't fill them out the way I should do. So it's, again, it's been that whole sort of my shape altering so radically has been a real insight in terms of designing because it's it's enabled me to see other problems with fit that maybe I've never really thought about before just because my body was a different shape, you know. So now I... I, I I'm very conscious that one of the issues with yokes is that often there can be too there can be too much here as well as too much here, you know. So it's sort of there's a there's a lot to think about, a lot of things you have to do to play and to make make them fit you perfectly. I think, and doing things like a pattern or a tailoring course or any sort of um, sewing instruction can really help you figure out how to make those little changes to make something fit you absolutely Better. perfectly. Better. Well, that's food for thought. Might try my hand. But if you, but I really yeah. just want sleeve and shoulder construction. I don't want to do like anything. Yeah, power. maybe there's something. Oh. They do online things, don't they? They might have sort of very specialized. Oh, maybe modules that are online maybe the other thing is there is the other version of this that actually has gathers here so if in doubt do a gathered sleeve head because then you don't have to get it spot on if you like that look it's not my yeah. cup of tea yeah. <laughs> fair enough then fair enough but yeah it is a it is a help to be able to just gather up the excess and give it a little soft little soft gather at the top if you if you're struggling to get it to fit Thank you for that. Yes, <laughs> it's a pleasure. I thought I'd show an accessory as well because everything was, I've also realised pretty much everything is colour work. I do do things that aren't colour work, but for some reason, I think because we were talking about Jeannie, it just got me on a bit of a colour work, uh, into a colour work headspace. But this is, um, we've got... But, I wait, got the, but, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That begs the question what is your favorite type of knitting to do is it color work that you prefer to cables lace I think it is I think it is I do love lace as well though actually I do I do really like 
lace, but I do, I do love colour work. I think you can just be so expressive with colour work, maybe in ways that you can't be with things that are a single colour. Um, and I love being able to play with colour and it gives me that, colour work gives me that opportunity. So maybe I should actually, as we're talking about playing with colour, I think I'll, I'll switch to these first. So I've just, I have literally just this last week um, published a book with Liner Publishing. So this is the first time I've actually worked with an external publisher. I've always um, published my own books before, usually because they're so big that nobody would ever, no one would ever pay to uh, to publish them for me. Um, but it's been an amazing experience, but they, they a bit like Carol at the museum, she gave, they gave me the opportunity to to choose my topic to decide what I wanted to do um, and so I I had been for for quite a long time been thinking about the influence of other people on our lives so I suppose taking this comp this sort of searching for the stories out of the knitwear and actually looking for stories and people that had inspired me um, and so I I designed a collection that is basically that I picked um, 24 women who over my lifetime have inspired me in some way and then created designs that were inspired by that inspiration and so this this particular one so this is this is color work again which is why I thought I would show you um is called Vita and it's inspired by Vita Sackville West who was um she was a poet and an author and a garden designer. Um, and she was one of the Bloomsbury set. Um, she was for, for a short time. Well, actually, I think for quite a long time, she was Virginia Woolf's uh, lover. Um, and she was the inspiration for Orlando, um, the book that Virginia Woolf wrote. Um, so, yeah, she was quite a, she was quite a, influential and impactful person basically but yeah so this is my this is my uh vita uh, cardigan so this is this is this is my this is the one that fits me so um this is sort of quite a boxy fit and slightly short uh shorter length version um but i wanted it to feel i had this sort of sort of twin thing going on as well as the inspiration i wanted the designs to feel like they were already heirlooms although you were you you were just completing them to feel like they were something that you'd you'd found in your granddad's wardrobe or you know or you'd gone to an old country cottage for a weekend and there happened to be a an old sweater folded up in a cupboard and things something like that so this one very much gives me that vibe of something that's been around for a long long time and um, but actually you know it is just so I'll just uh, close up on the how many colors are in there this this version which is why i was going to, why i wanted to show you them this version has got seven um but i would like to think it's quite nicely done so that it actually looks more i think it does think look like more which is why i asked you because i knew yeah. this was nine and i thought that looks more yeah like, but tricky. it's just that just the placement of the different colors next to each other and one of the things that um you know garden design i think can be really helpful in doing with color work is is that idea of if you think about when you look at a beautiful border in a garden there are often so so many colors in there and yet they all work together and mm. um, you don't need to be restricted you know you don't restrict what what colors go in there a lot of the time there can be an absolute riot of colors but in the right proportions and blended together in the right way it can still look you know like a beautiful sorry about that, that noise there but yeah it can still look like they were all intended to be together but what I then did as I say that's the seven color one but then I did a much more sort of early 20th century version of it that actually has a uh, lovely little inset pockets as well and this one is exactly the same pattern 
uh, but it's got 11 colors in it so i if you so there are there are two there are two charts to it but yeah this so this one has got 11 11 shades for exactly the same uh the seven looks perfectly gorgeous yeah but this one just i think this one just has a slightly more maybe just a little less tonal it's got a little bit more variety i think to it so i mean both both are beautiful i think um but yeah this one is also these little pockets are inspired by funny of going back to the vintage shetland so a nice little bit of sort of circular storytelling um after i'd finished the book um i was back at shetland just doing some last bits and bobs and a garment had come in that was a 1920s golfing sweater. And it had these amazing little pockets, just like this with the motif carried across the front. And they were called tea pockets. So they were there for putting your golf tees in. Oh. So I just thought that would be a really nice touch because it very much gives me the feel of those sort of 1920s um, long lined cardigans that people would wear to to do sports in oh, I love <laughs> that whole look that whole period I'm doing a golf sweater myself which fit problems three colors oh. and ripping it out is a little bit of a nightmare but it's going to be gorgeous when I finally finish it and if you if you took that straight from a vintage pattern yes 1930s yeah. It's called For the Rink or the Lynx. And it was in some Australian newspaper, I think. I like that, For the Rink or the Lynx, yeah. I mean, it's amazing to think that these were considered sportswear at the time, isn't it? You know, it's, you know, the idea... But that they have time to play golf if they were knitting because it's not uh, a small feat to knit one of these. No, no it's not. A, a wide array of people who knit for you? Not all the time, no. A lot of the time I knit them myself, but the but this last book that I've just done, I did use sample knitters for, for them, yes, because I'd have never have got it completed, never. Okay, like you are going for the ultimate prize of Wonder Woman because you have a yarn company, you're an author, you're self-publishing, you're a mom, which is a very large job, wife. And you have time to knit a sweater like this and others? Like not as much as I would like. What do you I eat for like breakfast? Porridge. <laughs> every day. Have to have porridge. Yeah, every day. <laughs> but okay. yeah, I do. I, I get um it depends. If I'm working on a very specific project, I will find I will try and find the time to give myself more knitting hours. But to be honest, I I would say I probably have two two hours a day on average to knit well if it took me four and a half months to knit this and I was monogamous on this how long would it take you to knit that what you're I'm holding quite, I'm quite fast I suppose um I would say I would say this this would probably take me about a month maybe six weeks oh my goodness so what's your knitting style are you on a belt with a long needle no I do circular I I have tried I have been I have had lessons with a belt but it just doesn't do it for me I I really struggle I don't really like to hold my work close to my body so it doesn't I never quite found the thing that works for me so for me it's circular circular needles all the time and I'd love one to color... see I'd love to see you knitting if you're so fast do you have something handy oh that would be I really haven't got any knitting with me. No. And I, I don't know that I'm that fast I'm just consistent I suppose I just with color work I I tend to like to work in the blocks of the motif and I think if you sort of say to yourself write one motif tonight I can, how I can gear managing, myself up. And, how are you managing your yarn? Are you holding different colors in both hands or everything is on one hand? Both. One, 
one in each hand, yeah. So the uh, foreground colour in that hand, background colour in in that hand. Okay. Yeah, all the time, round and round. Yeah, round and if round. If you do and I that enough times, I mean, I also hold in both hands. I don't do so much colour work, but when I do, I'm I'm doing both hands. And I think if you do it enough, you can pick up a rhythm and it will oh, go yeah. as fast as regular knitting. In a yeah, I mean, I, I think I think I'm possibly faster with colour work than with plain stocking stitch because, right. as I say, the rhythm of the pattern keeps me motivated, whereas with stocking stitch, my mind can start to wander. And I think when your mind starts to wander, that's when your speed slows slows down just plain stuck in it and one color is kind of mindless you don't have to think your mind can wander it doesn't matter that's true uh, that's i am true. sort of curious though when you've written the pattern is it like already in your head and you don't have to refer to the chart the the, the maths and the stitch counts uh you you have to look at the pattern but the visual side of it now normally once i've done something that's a repeat pattern once i've done it once i don't normally need to look at it again I can normally memorize them and knit without looking at the pattern so I suppose that makes it quicker well because you designed it I, I would think if it's your design it's already in your brain yeah although I, I am very I do have a real I'm much better with visual than written so I think charts just sort of like stick whereas if I was reading it you know I think that's one of the reasons why I've always had the urge to translate the vintage patterns because long, long lines of like three N two B three N. I can't, I can't do it. I'm completely, in, I'm absolutely incapable of reading of reading that from start to finish. I can never find my way back to the the place that I looked at before. I looked away, so. I find it, I can't do it. So in there, I I know exactly what you're talking about because some of the patterns that I work from, one that I'm working on now is that it's just spelled out. The one that I'm ripping yeah. out was spelled out. Now that I have it knit, I use that as my chart. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like yeah. ripping out, but I still refer to the thing that I knit as my chart because there's no chart. Yeah. I, I mean, I could get breath paper and chart it, and then there's digital solutions for that too. But yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I will always, one of the first things I'll do with the color work or, or lace or even textural vintage pattern is turn is find the chart is find where the the pattern starts and finishes and and get it onto a chart so i can start making much more sense of what it is that that you're doing because once you've got that you can you can make it any size any width right. that you want yeah. but you've just got to know what you're dealing with don't you but 200 stitches wide of just three two three two three or whatever it just it, I find it mind-boggling absolutely mind-boggling so yeah I'd yeah it's yep. always my my I first can, my first I can yeah. definitely relate and I hope that some <laughs> of the viewers can also relate I hope so. I mean I understand why people like the written I do because if it's what you're used to it's you know charts can be uh, there's such a different thing but I think once you understand what they're doing they can be so they're just so helpful and so useful you know and that they, they literally show you what you're knitting you right. you, you, you know right. that's the thing you've got a picture in front of you of what you're trying to do which can be so and particularly with color work it's you know what what more do you need really other than just a, a picture of what it's of, of of what color each stitch is that's well, that's I all color work people... is I hope the people watching will comment below and say if they prefer to work from chart or if they're perfectly comfortable using the written out knit three, purl two, two red. I think, BC, I think there's a difference. If it's not color work, I think it's slightly different. Because I mean, chart, I, I can understand why lace charts and cable charts can be quite, 
they can be quite terrifying. You know, you know that they've got all sorts of symbols and strange things that might not make sense. Colour work is very, very different. It is, it's just like somebody's taking a picture of what you're wearing and... And you can see it. Yeah. And you can see it. Yeah, I, th I think I think there are still quite a lot of people, certainly with lace, I think lace is one of those ones where some people really struggle to, to migrate to charts. And I think that's partly because with lace, you get this shifting of the pattern repeat quite often. And with the chart, it means that you're, you're sort of, you can see that you're doing this weird movement as, you, as you're working. And that can be quite difficult to, to comprehend what, why, why is the pattern repeat over there? Why is the, why does the row end two stitches to the right compared to where it was last time and things like that? And I think written instructions take that lack of clarity away in some respects. Well, for people watching, if you're not familiar at all with what we're talking about, my biggest tip, and I have a feeling that Susan would agree with me is use stitch markers. If you know that your pattern is 20 stitch repeat, put a stitch marker at the beginning of the 20 and at the end of the 20 and do that all the way across your row so that you can keep checking yourself. When I got to here and it repeats, and then I got to here and it repeats again, if I'm somewhere else in the motif, I know I have a mistake and I can fix yeah. it right there before I go on and have a really big problem. So stitch yeah. markers, stitch markers, stitch markers. Yeah, yeah, they are they are really, really useful. It's funny because sort of like my 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 grandmother's generation, they they never used anything. And you know, it must have been sometimes it must have been so difficult to to find your way around your knitting when you didn't have any sort of marker to to guide you you don't think they took a little um circle of yarn and used it as a stitch marker i rarely saw them doing it to oh. be honest with you I, I i did look and i very rarely saw them doing i mean to be honest with you i suppose by the time i was watching them knit they were at a point in life where maybe they were knitting the same t patterns that they'd knitted numerous times before they know so maybe heart. they yeah, maybe they didn't need to put in markers. I mean, did, they you did, ever, but, did you ever see them rip anything out and redo it? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, we all My, think like we're the only ones who have to tink back or completely oh, no. rip, but we all do it. You do it too? I do it all the time. Yes. Oh. I make lots of mistakes, lots of mistakes. I, I'm in such good company. I, I yes. I'm so relieved to know. Don't that be, don't be don't be scared of <laughs> Yeah, it it's fine. I mean, the beauty about knitting is you can take it out. That's that's it's well, it's great saving we want to avoid grace, it isn't it? As much as possible, so that we can you want to, to avoid it. But if you have to, I mean, I never saw my it. I never saw my mum take anything out, and nine times out of ten. I ended up with something that had a mistake in it and it used to drive me insane. So she would just leave it in because she couldn't be bothered. I mean, she was she was busy. So she just knitted it. And if there was a mistake, eh, you just had to live with it. But there was always she she made a mistake in ev everything that she made. <laughs> so uh, as did my 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 wonderful mother-in-law who died um the year before last she was my number one sample knitter for many years but she never ever 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 made anything without there being a mistake in it and it, it was often part of the fun was trying to find out where it was that she'd made the mistake because there'd always be one always but well we are human exactly and that comes with the territory yeah. Sometimes I mean, it's the pattern. Well, yeah. It right is. now I'm doing a pattern that was out of a book and I am 99% sure that they put extra small where they meant to say small and I was trying to 
do the wrong instructions for the size that I'm knitting. And I contacted them to say, is there any errata for this pattern? And I've heard nothing. Oh, Just dear. saying, sometimes it's not the knitter. I had no. no problems with Jeannie. Everything was spot on. The charts were clear and perfect. And where the steak was, this is my first time steaking. My only time. Gosh. Steaking. Oh, no. <laughs> and this, this was not a real sticky wool. This no. was extra fine merino. So I was uh, a little bit nervous about it. But I can imagine I, I it did. worked. So I had Frey check right there. And <laughs> I used it. I used it. Yeah. But people in my group who knit with Shetland wool, no problem. They just cut puff puff yeah. and exactly. I think one person didn't even secure the stitches. It, it, I yeah. don't. I mean, if you're using the right kind of wool yeah you, you can cut without and especially if you know you're immediately going to pick up the stitches you, you, yeah I picked I up the stitches time. before I cut oh did you <laughs> I used a very thin needle and I inserted it all the way up because I wanted the line to be straight yeah. and neat and you know really good and it's on an angle so you know it's a little bit tricky but I'm super super happy with the results it yeah was, it's beautiful it was worth the investment of the time plus it was fun to do it with these other people yeah yeah anyway not to take away from what oh else no 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 I love listening yeah I love I love hearing what you what you what you've added to it or how you how you've approached it because those sort of things that you might have thought of something that I'd never thought of, which is, you know, and then I, I, I think every one of us is always learning. There's always something more to, to find out. And well, when I do have the time, it's nice to like look at other people's patterns and things as well. Oh yeah. This whole part was interesting. Some of the people just let it be like very rounded and I saw the mm. picture of the original and I thought but it's more like a trapezoid shape so I worked very hard yeah. to fold to fold this in to get it to yeah. that shape well part of me thinks that that was that was a mistake on Jeannie's part I don't know whether she intended it to do that or whether when she's picked up the stitches she just hasn't thought of mitering the the stitches as she as she made the band and when she's cast off she's ended up with this sort of loose flappy bit at the front and she's turned what would have been a mistake into a, a very striking feature well, that was That's my sort favorite of, part I mean yeah me, I love it made this so different from yeah. every other fair isle pattern that I'd seen Oh yeah, it's so distinctive. It's it's quite. I've never seen anything like it. It's quite unique, I think. And also, the fact that each one of these patterns is unique. There's no repeat of this. Just the period pattern is the repeat. Yeah, it yeah. Made it, it. It you know really inspires you to keep knitting, keep knitting because you want to get to the next motif. You're really yeah. tired of this one by the time you're done, and it's like, oh goody, there's something like fresh and new. It kept changing which yeah. really made it I mean it's a while ago that I did this but I do remember that that it kept me going because this is a lot of knitting yeah, of knitting. yeah. even the ribbing was uh, it's a lot you know vintage patterns there's often like three oh, yeah. four <laughs> inches of ribbing but if you want this you have to do that exactly yeah, if you want it, you've got to you've got to do the work to get it. Yeah, it's just the way it is, isn't it? Yeah, and I I, really, <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. The Good. secret was though doing it with a group because we all were motivated to come back, you know, time after time and compare notes. And you didn't want to be the one who didn't get to the next section, mm. get left behind. So 
people kept up a few people dropped out along the way but a number of people you know really kept up and yeah finished and I'm sure they're just as happy with theirs as I am with mine that's great that's I mean it's cold in New York today normally I'm wearing it just sleeveless but I put something on it because it's chilly it looks looks really good with a layer underneath it though It, it shows again it can be worn in different ways Normally, I really I like it like that. No, no but anyway, yeah, it's, it's for, far too. Oh no, I really like it for I creating really like this audience. for oh. knitters like me. <laughs> it's my absolute pleasure, absolute pleasure. So, would you like me to show you one last little thing? Yeah, yeah, and then... please, as much as you want. People are so going this... to be glued to their seats. I oh. Mean... So many people admire you. I don't have to tell you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying not to get emotional now. But oh, you. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this this little hat is um, I some of you some of your uh, followers may well know that there's a a new version of um, Stitching Time two. That I, I was working on and it's called Stitching Time 2 Revisited. So the the original version of the book that I I published in 2000, uh, 2012 um, and it's been through a, a few reprints over the years, but it's it's need just like everything. It needed a bit of a bit of love and a bit of attention to bring it up to date. Um, and I've extended the size and range and things. So it's it's meant that the sort of there's less patterns in the book, but they are more, they are a much wider range. And I've been again, as I was saying, you always learn things. I think my pattern writing has improved. So I've I've put that better pattern writing skills into the the new versions of the patterns. But because it's a new version of the book, I wanted to put an extra little pattern in. Um, which is what I did uh, with volume one when I last adapted that one as well. So this one is called the Target Berry Beret. Um, and it's, it, I just absolutely love this beret. So that is the, the crown. Um, these are the colours as in the original pattern, pretty much. Um, and then it's got this lovely uh, motif underneath the, the crown. And then it's got this really nice little um, doubled hemmed, so it's not ribbed, it's stocking stitch and you you cast on and then you, you knit double and then you fold it and then you pick up the stitches and knit them together. But it creates this really, really nice uh, beret shape um, and you've got one, two, three, four and motifs. And this one in particular is really quite unusual because it's it's it gives you this asymmetry as well, which is quite quite interesting and very different um and the the other quite unusual thing that you might just be able to see um is that it's it's done in a very very sort of what's the word it's a much more sort of blocky sort of look than most of the sort of um vintage berets are normally this would be much more sort of uh, pointy and um, long whereas it's it's almost like a it feels quite 70s in a way I think the actual finish but actually it's a 1940s pattern um, so it just feels really really different and, and really unusual for the for the period and um, the pattern however was it was written exactly how we've just discussed it was written longhand and it was knitted for the beret to be worked flat. And then you sewed it together, which I never quite understand why. Why, But yes, so I, again, I had to find all the different spots to, to write each of the motifs and find where, as you move from one to the next, how they're supposed to sort of sit above each other. Um, then, then chart it then uh, get the, the crown recreated. Um, I really like the way the, the decreased sections sort of really stand out and almost look like they're a, 
there a cable twist right, where it's right. actually just okay. the it's just the decreases but it gives it such a such a bit of surface texture it's really it's really interesting um and then of course i've then multi-sized it as well so that it's not just a single sized beret because obviously we heads do differ really quite dramatically one of the really me and my daughter actually have sort of probably the furthest apart head size as two people can possibly have she's she's got a lovely she's lovely dainty little head and I've I've really got quite a large head and um, so yeah so we have to have quite you know we can't wear the same hat basically without it either it like falls down her forehead or it sits right up at the top on me so uh yeah but I just this was a it was just really really interesting to to uh to get the pattern sorted I just think the colorway is just amazing um and it's just so different and, and really quite unique and I just I just think it's it's really really exciting are those the original colors too they are yeah yeah so I, 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 you know, pretty within a very short, a very small variation base because these are these are my yarns. So these are the colours that I've already got. But within that, they're very, very similar. Yeah, yeah. So how many the brown and the. How many different lines of yarn do you have? Um, I've got quite a few now. Um, I've got. Let me think. I have two sock yarns so one called lock and one called bloom um i then have exolana which is this one which is the one that i've has been going for the longest um and is yeah is a beautiful yarn and does vintage things really really well and it's great for color work um, and then fenella which is the the vintage three ply weight yarn so when you're going for that slightly finer finish like with like with Ewell, um, Fenella is brilliant for that because it gives you, it will give you about a, a 36 stitch to the 10 centimetres. So when you're looking at a, lo a lot of vintage knitting patterns that have, say, a, a, a nine stitch to the inch um, gauge, as they, as, they are, as they would word it, that gives you that perfectly. So it's a really useful one. Um, and then I've got Barn and Bayer, which are fingering weight and a double knit weight of the same yarn so this the the vita one that i showed you this one this is this is in the buyer so this is a natural gray yarn and um, that we dye my daughter is um the hand dyer here and um, so i say what color i want and then we work out the recipes and then charlie is in charge of actually sort of dyeing the yarn and um, she, she's amazing. Her colour palette is is fantastic. But Charlie's yeah, so with this daughter. one, uh, she's uh, Charlie's your daughter. That's her name. Sorry, yes, yeah. Charlotte is a is was her birth name. Um, she wouldn't like to be called that, so she doesn't like. It. She likes Charlie, and she is a Charlie. She's. I'm a Billy. It's not my given name. Yeah, exactly. It's that. Yeah, Wilma. It's a... They named me Wilma. Can you imagine? <laughs> they never called me so that. Never. No, it's a very serious name, isn't it, Wilma? I was named after my grandfather, William, and they called him Bill. Yeah. So out of the gate, they called me Billy. Yeah. Only the teachers at school had to call me Wilma. Oh. Mm, no, you don't want, no. Yeah, Charlie <laughs> has been a Charlie pretty much since she was born as well. Yeah, she was never, never really going to be anything, anything else. But she's, she was, um, she trained as a, as a chef. And so, um, dyeing is very much cooking it's very very similar you follow recipes you heat it up measure you get it to the perfect temperature right. you measure it yeah so yeah it's she absolutely loves doing the the hand dyeing so All right, so i was um, counting you're up to six yeah uh was that but did you do barn and buyer then or just buyer i think i counted two for those i i think okay. I counted, right maybe not yeah One, are there more two, than six three. lines I think so. Yeah. There's also there's also the DK weight of Exelana, which is this, which is what this one is, okay, so uh, is knitted in. Seven. So this is the DK weight, um, and then we've now also got an Aran weight as well, um, which we haven't really released properly yet, um, but it's just coming out with the with the new book. 
yeah so quite a lot really it's a lot yeah but I suppose once you start, once you start on that route, you you want to have everything that you need to do the designs that you create. So it's very hard to to stop once you start, really, because you just yeah. Each time you you need something different, you think, oh, we haven't quite got that. We could we could get it spun and and have a different one. No, it's so. not just the different weights, but then it's also different sheep breeds different blends yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so the barn and buyer are um they are a mixture of jacobs and shetland wool so um this is this is the dk weight but you can just see it's so there's both white shetland and black shetland mixed together in this one and um, so it and then it's got jacobs which is sort of a a, a brownish sort of finish when it's when it's once it's uh, prepared for spinning but then once you mix it all together you get a lovely sort of heathery gray tone um and then when you dye over that that's when you get that lovely sort of soft and mottled sort of mm -hmm. so when you come to do color work they really sort of because they they've got that underlying bit of gray holding them together Pretty much any colour that you put together works because they've got the same, they've got the same tone underneath. Mm -hmm. Um, so it it just it just it makes colour work, I think, easier because you're not you're not dealing with things that have got a different uh, base colour underneath the dye, which can alter how it looks when you when you when you put the colours together. I don't um, know how people some people choose a variety of different yarns and put them together. I chose one type of yarn in a variety of colors just because I wanted the texture and the behavior to be the same throughout. And yet, mm. and yet, even though I ordered them all at the same time, I found that some colors were just a little bit thicker <laughs> than other yeah. colors. Sometimes it can be it can be the spin, but sometimes actually dye can weigh different. Dye can alter the, the how a, a a yarn feels. So one color can can behave differently to another. It could even be that one color has been heated five degrees higher than the other one, so it's caused the the fibers just to open up a little bit more than the other one. And you know, it's it's such. It is an organic fiber. It's it it behaves in so so many different and unexpected ways sometimes, but that makes it really fascinating. I think. Well, it worked. I mean, in the end, you can't. Yeah. Also, no, just you can't. Something... I mean, and it's going to be. It, it's probably only going to be in the in the handle, but when you actually knit it, it probably hopefully tightened back up to the same sort of look as, yeah, as, I, as each other anyway you can't tell it's too fine no yeah no I can't I couldn't tell anything no yeah well, I did. a pure delight for me and I hope for the audience as well I can't thank you enough I mean what can I say for the coming year ahead I wish you the very best health going forward for everyone myself included <laughs> this has been yes. what did the queen say the anus horribilis that's yes. it for me this was the worst year oh. of my life so i am really looking forward to 2024 and wishing you a happy holiday and good health to you and your family Thanks for sharing all your knowledge and the beautiful stories. <sighs> thank what you. can I say? Thank you for having what me. What can I say? Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.